So good afternoon and welcome to the Barrett London Investor Webinar held in association with uh, Knight Frank and the Mortgage Advice Bureau. Thank you very much for attending this afternoon. Normally, uh, in a normal world, we would schedule regular investor and help to buy events in central London where we have hundreds of attendees. We hire a, a prominent venue. We have guest speakers. Uh, but what's the common theme is there's lots of uh, interested people who are trying to take the confusion out on and simplify the home buying process. I guess uh, today is no different. Uh, clearly, with the rule of six, this has become kind of unfeasible. However, we are aware that many potential purchasers out there are still hungry for the advice. Therefore, uh, the, the objective remains the same today, just a completely different format. So. Let's have a look at uh, what we're going to cover today. Delighted to welcome Tom, who is Head of Residential Research at Knight Frank. He's going to cover three main topics, market analysis pre-COVID-19, why this is different to 2008-9, and then let's look at the, some of the short-term and the long-term property trends. Should give you confidence, hopefully, that now is a good time to invest. Then I'm going to hand over to Rachel from the Mortgage Advice Bureau. Rachel will cover the current mortgage offerings, the uh, stamp due to uh, savings that are currently on offer from the government, and uh, an overview of the current mortgage market. And then finally, my session uh, will cover why uh, it's good reasons to invest in new build with, with Barrett London specifically. I'm gonna focus in on the capital growth potential, particularly around some of the regeneration schemes that we have across London. I'll give you an overview of our developments and then launch an exclusive uh, guarant rental guarantee offer, which is available in September if you reserve a property with Barrett London. The final session, if there are any uh, question and answers or questions throughout the presentation, please use the functionality in Zoom uh, to submit your questions. Depending on the time, uh, we'll uh, have the opportunity to put some of the questions to um, the panel of experts. Please be gentle with us. Any questions that we do not have a chance to answer, we will put onto a landing page and then look out for an email from us next week where we will post the answers to your questions on our webinar website. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Tom. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Ed. Uh, thank you for allowing me this opportunity to present you with some of our thoughts on the uh, London property markets. I'm going to talk about 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, and as you said, Split into three key areas. First, a brief look at what was happening in the property market before COVID-19 came along, which is a useful thing to do when thinking about what happens next. Uh, I should then look at what's different between now uh, and 2008-2009. And then finally, I will explain what both of those things tell us about how the residential market will emerge from the pandemic in the, in the short and longer term. So, uh, next slide, please. A quick Reminder, first of all, of where we were then, which as I said, is a useful starting point in trying to anticipate what happens next. What you can see on this first chart is annual growth rates for prices in the UK, Greater London and Prime Central London. And what's clear is that property markets across the UK underwent a period of repricing and were beginning actually to stabilize through 2019. And this was something that was happening before the general election came along. This adjustment in prices had happened as a result of tax changes, including, of course, the stamp duty and ATED and lots of other uh, uh, tax changes that we've seen in recent years. It was also due to the volatile political climate that we've seen, uh, including, of course, Brexit and to some extent the tighter lending environment that persisted after the global financial crisis. So when we think about what happens next and people uh, are having lots of conversations and thoughts about that, I think what's important to bear in mind is you need to understand the trends that had already been underway for many years before COVID-19 came along. Just by way of example, in 2019, we had the highest number of transactions in Prime Central London since 2015. Average pound per square foot prices in the so-called golden postcodes, Knightsbridge, Mayfair, Arthur Arabia, were £150 below their five hundred fifty pounds below their five year average. So that's important context to bear in mind as we consider how the London property market emerges from this. A longer term readjustment in prices had already taken place and transaction numbers were edging up as a result. Next slide please. We can see here on this second chart uh, it shows the difference between 
the global financial crisis and the COVID-19 pandemic. It just really makes that point uh, even more clearly. It just shows how weak prices have been in the five years to February, which is the three columns on the right hand side. You can see actually prime central London prices declined by around 10, 15%, same uh, similar trend in prime outer London. And that compares uh, or that contrasts completely with what was happening before the run up to the global financial crisis when prices were rising by 70, 75, 80% plus uh, over the five years before the last recession. So that's one important factor to bear in mind. People are, uh, are predicting sizable double digit price declines this time round, but actually in simple terms, there's been very little meat put on the bone over the last five years in terms of house price growth. And this is acting as a break on any price declines. And I'll look in a moment at how prices are currently performing. Next slide, please. Another uh, absolutely crucial difference between this time round uh, and last time for the property market is that supply and demand are not out of sync. So what you can see here is the data from the RICS for supply and demand in London. And you can see that what happened in March of this year is that both of those things effectively fell off a cliff at the same time in March before both rebounding in unison. Now, if you look back to 2008, you can see that that simultaneous movement didn't happen last time around. There was a fall in demand, but supply actually spiked higher, and that was the catalyst for such large price falls last time around. Of course, much of that was caused by poor sellers who were struggling with higher interest rates, which is something, again, I'll come on to in a moment. So the fact that supply and demand are both headed south and have both subsequently rebounded in unison is a major key difference between 2008 and the current situation. Next slide please. The next chart shows the link between the UK economy and its property market. Now the first thing that stands out is that the line for prime central London, the red line, jumps around uh, a lot more. It's a lot more volatile and we can see uh, we can see that quite clearly throughout the last years and, and decades. What this tells us is that any recovery is likely to be quicker in prime markets as opposed to mainstream markets. So buyers are typically in a more liquid uh, position. There is a currency discount which I'll come on to in a moment and of course there is a safe haven aspect as well for UK property which will also also play its part in that trend. Now safe haven investments are very much on the radar for, for, for investors at the moment. Look at what's happened to the gold price uh, in recent weeks and months. Uh, it'll, it'll tell you exactly uh, what's going on there. The second thing that this chart shows you, if you look carefully actually at the last five or six years, uh, is that what you can see is that the link between the UK economy and the housing market has actually got weaker. They, they, there's been less of a correlation over the last five or six Yes, and that's due to, I think, to the two reasons that I mentioned before, political uncertainty uh, and tax hikes. So the first conclusion from this slide is that the, the, the prime markets, higher value markets, will probably be quicker to respond as we emerge from this pandemic. There are all sorts of restrictions on, at the moment around international travel. I can mention those in a second. Um, but prime markets in general are quicker to respond. The second conclusion is that as issues like Brexit and stamp duty finally work their way through the system, we can see the impact they've had in recent years, but as they finally work their way on the, through the system, this will also act as a break, uh, or this will stop acting as a break on house price growth. Next slide, please. We use uh, several different economic forecasts to judge what's gonna happen next to prices, as well as the key indicators from property markets. And you can see three, uh, of those economic forecasts on this next chart. Oxford Economics forecasting a 6% drop in GDP this year before 7% increase in 2021. The OBR forecast is much steeper, uh, much steeper decline in 2020. But what you can see that they all do is a big sharp decline followed by an uptick that broadly mirrors the fall. It's the same basic pattern. Now the two key risks for the economy and for property markets at the moment are the effects of the government withdrawing its support measures such as the furlough scheme and we're starting to hear a bit more now from the Chancellor around how he may uh, withdraw that in a targeted way so there is no cliff edge uh, for the employment market and of course the other risk is the size and the impact of any second wave of COVID-19. Now that said there are other key differences between what's happening now and 2008 that are worth highlighting. 
Next slide, please. Um, here are two further ways that the current downturn doesn't mirror what happened last time round. First, unemployment, which I touched on uh, just now. It's not expected by forecasters to climb as high, which the chart on the left shows. It looks at the, the Oxford economic forecast, which is talking around employment peaking at around, uh, unemployment, sorry, peaking at around 7% before falling back much more quickly than last time. Other forecasts are for a higher spike, but there, again, there is broad agreement on the shape of what's going to be happening in the unemployment market. Um, essentially, what's the effect of the unemployment, the effect on the unemployment market uh, on unemployment will be more limited than last time around. In other words, we'll, have, we'll avoid that prolonged overhang that we saw after 2008. Now, if I draw your attention to the chart on the right, that's really just a reminder of the fairly obvious fact that UK rates, UK interest rates have been ultra low now for more than a decade. And what this does and what this has done now for several years is provide quite a stable backdrop for the housing market for recent years. So despite all of the tax hikes and tax changes that we've seen, the Brexit uncertainty, we haven't actually seen that much in the way of double digit annual price movements in either direction, which is something you, you saw also on that previous chart. So the point here to make really is if you look at both the housing market data and the economic data, you come to the inevitable conclusion that comparisons with 2008 are actually of limited use. Uh, and there are reasons to believe that the property market is going to come out of this downturn more quickly. Next slide, please. Before I come on to look at exactly what's happening now and what's likely to happen next, it's worth just noting that there will be an impact on transactions, of course, in 2020. And I think this next slide probably gives you a snapshot of what that is likely to be across the whole of the UK. Now, our current forecast is that the total number of UK sales will be down 15 cent compared to 2019. Now, originally we had thought uh, the figure would be more like 40 percent, but we've changed our minds since the market, uh, how the market's been performing since it reopened. This, the numbers here on this slide uh, show the government data. So you can see the low point there was April. So there were 50% fewer transactions in April this year than there were in April last year. But as you can see, those numbers are now gradually improving and starting to pick up. Indeed, what we've seen actually is a fairly unusual seasonal, seasonal pattern of activity as both buyers and sellers have become very active since the market reopened in mid-May. That includes through the typically quieter July and August period. Next slide, please. Now we can see just how active the market has been with this next chart. So through the traditionally quieter summer period, as I say, the number of new uh, prospective buyers registering was around uh, a third higher than it was in the first week of the year. Now, normally, as you can see, the green line, which shows the five-year average in terms of the seasonal pattern of new applicants registering with us, there tends to be a decline down towards the summer. So we find that by the summer, the number's around 20% lower than it was at the start of the year. This year, the numbers are around a third higher. So what that means, if you're a buyer, is that it clearly pays at the moment to do your homework. And I think, in fact, in many cases, first viewings have become the equivalent of second viewings. Uh, through the more widespread use of video technology. So demand has sprung back. Uh, and I think the extent of that taken many people by surprise. And, and I think it's fair to say, unless you've been watching the market closely uh, for several years, of course. As I've already said, what's happening now is about much more than buyers uh, getting itchy feet during eight weeks of lockdown. There's been lots of pent up demand that's been building for several years. But we're starting to see that now come through. Next slide, please. Now, the same thing has happened with supply. Uh, new supply in the first week of July was three times higher than it was in the first week of the year before it began uh, to level off more recently. Now, that compares to an average increase over the last five years uh, of 26%. So the fact that there is this marked increase in supply as well as demand makes me think that this current period of activity is sustainable. Now, what's happening is not just a demand led recovery. And I think that's being reflected in the record number of deals that are now going under offer. In fact, if you look at what went under offer uh, in recent months, we are as busy as we have been in more than 20 years. Next slide, please. That's taking its time to be reflected, of course, in the number of exchanges as deals, uh, as deals take their time to work, work their way from going under offer 
through to exchange, but I don't, there's no sign of deals falling through at an, uh, an unusually high rate at the moment. So we expect that will start to feed through into the number of exchanges in the coming weeks and months. What this chart shows you, however, is the losses that were incurred during lockdown have now more than been recovered on the basis of those number of deals going under offer. It shows the cumulative number of deals going, offer, going under offer throughout the year. The five-year average in London uh, and the country markets versus what's happening in 2020. You can see 2020 is now outperforming in both London and in country markets. What you can also see is that London bounced actually a little bit more strongly after the election, but it was the country markets, those markets outside of London, uh, that came back more strongly immediately after the market reopened. And I just want to touch on that um, trend now. Next slide, please. Now, you will all be aware of the stories around a spike in demand for people looking for more outdoor space. Uh, and undoubtedly, that to some extent is true. But I think what you can see on this chart is actually something a bit more interesting that's going on in terms of the pattern of behavior over the last few months. Now it tracks where our London-based buyers are looking and you can see initially demand actually spiked, spiked in the southwest of the country. People decided they wanted to be more remote, they wanted to be more rural, but over time that has shifted back towards the southeast. And I think what's been happening is people have realized their ability to commute into London, the capital, was still a very important place for them to be. I imagine there will be some, some changing around, some deep seated change around working from home, but I'm wary of saying that there'll be a longer term structural shift away from the capital. That would simply reverse centuries of urbanization. It reminds me slightly of the period that followed 9 11 when some people said it was the end of the office tower. And of course, it proved anything but in the longer term. What we're seeing. Uh, now, however, is some rebalancing between um, people between the country and London, but activity in the capital uh, is, is as strong as it's been. And for example, in August, the number of uh, offers accepted in London was the highest number we've seen in 20 years. So I think the story around the, the moving to the country is, is, is happening, it's significant, but I think it's masked actually what's happening in London, which is also a very strong market, even by historical standards. Now, the next chart shows what all of that means for prices in London. Now, I think essentially, in a nutshell, bargain hunters, lockdown bargain hunters, are probably going to be disappointed at what's going on. Discounts are still being negotiated, of course, but sellers, and this data refers to the second-hand market, I should say, rather than the new build market, but sellers are hardening their resolve, I think, as demand is actually growing more quickly than supply. So what this chart shows you is in London, on average, offers were accepted at 98% of the asking price in July, which is a percentage point higher than it was in the same month last year. Similarly, the number of the, the offers made have gone from 94 to 95% of the asking price over the, over the last 12 months. In fact, there have been numerous instances where agreed prices have exceeded the asking price. Uh, and in London, while prices are, are, are rising, not rising on an annual basis, we are actually seeing some month on month growth now, particularly uh, in the leafiest suburbs. Everywhere we're seeing pricing now beginning to stabilize. And we are seeing, it's probably worth pointing out, the return also of sealed bids in some markets. On top of everything else, of course, we've had a stamp duty holiday, uh, which is really uh, already starting to have quite a big impact, particularly in the sub one, sub one and a half million pounds market. So as this chart shows, the number of offers accepted in UK markets between the 8th of July and the 6th of September was 146% above the five year average for properties valued at less than 1.5 million pounds. Now that's the section of the market where the impact of the holiday, the impact of that 15,000 pound saving is felt the most. Now, above that figure, the increase uh, in things, the number of offers in, uh, agreed did increase, but it was more modest. And it was a similar trend in terms of the number of new prospective buyers registering and the number of viewing. So you can see quite clearly the extra kickstart the market has had with the stamp duty holiday. And just to dwell on that for a moment, I think the broader point to make on the holiday is that it wasn't designed really to help the housing market in isolation, but I think a recognition that there is a notable uh, multiplier effects for the whole economy from the residential property market. What I think is that it may signal stamp duty 
becoming to be looked at from an economic rather than a political perspective that we've seen as we've seen in recent years. However, I wouldn't expect the government to backtrack on the 2% surcharge for overseas buyers that comes into effect next April. But if you are a non-resident buyer, there is now quite a, an obvious ticking clock that's going to be counting down towards uh, next April, where if you transact before the 1st of April, you'll be, uh, you'll be saving on that 2%. So for a million pound property, for example, you'll be saving £35,000 if you transact for next April. I think that's going to become much more into focus for overseas buyers in the next weeks uh, and months. I think towards the end of the year, I think it could well push demand higher from overseas buyers, uh, as well as, of course, any movement in the pound caused by Brexit, which I'll come on to I'll touch on in a moment. Um, before I do that and, and wrap up, I just want to take a very brief look at the lettings market. Uh, I think the next, next slide, please, Ed. Unlike the sales market, um, it's probably fair to say the summer has been quieter than normal for deal activity. If supply is catching up with demand in the sales market, I think it's, it's the other way around in the lettings market. Supply uh, of rental property remained fairly robust during lockdown. Uh, as Owners hedged their bets uh, and more short-term lets appeared on the market. On the demand side, it's been, it's been weaker primarily due to the fact uh, demand from two key groups, students uh, and corporates, has been lower. Students, of course, face uncertainty around the start of the academic year. Uh, and we didn't really see that usual spike in demand that we saw over the summer months. So it's fair to say demand is now beginning to pick up and should be more consistent and less seasonal through to the end of the year. Meanwhile, of course, companies are still belt tightening. Uh, relocation packages aren't what they were. Uh, and so that's due to economic uncertainty caused by the pandemic, obviously, but also logistical uh, constrictions as well. So while well, demand indicators have remained high, more so in traditional lower value markets, there hasn't been the same level, normal level of tenancy starting in the prime London lettings market. And as you can see here on the left hand side, new prospective tenants, so that's demand in 2020 below what it was last year, whereas market appraisal, that's letting supply coming onto the market, higher than it was uh, in 2020. And that's been reflected in the fact that rental values are still uh, edging down both on a monthly and on an annual basis. Next slide, uh, please, Ed. Um, for overseas buyers, however, I think it's worth pointing out, and it's something easy to probably forget, that there are still sizable discounts by historical standards. The pound, of course, has been volatile. Uh, it's recently come under pressure due to talk of negative interest rates, the prospect of a no-deal Brexit. Even this week, we've seen the Imperial Markets Bill going through Parliament and causing uh, uh, volatility in the pound. But I think it's still worth underlining it's still at a level where there is a significant discount for overseas buyers. That'll help to derive demand, uh, particularly in prime markets across London. For example, somebody denominated in US dollars has seen their buying power grow uh, in recent years, if their budget was the equivalent of £1 million at the start of 2014, as this chart shows, for the same dollar budget, they can now afford a £1.4 million property in London, given how far prices for the pound uh, have fallen. If we go on to the next slide, uh, please, Ed, we can see that for a range of overseas currencies, there are still discounts of 20, 20 plus percent for many currencies uh, in central London markets compared to now and the period before the referendum. Discount takes into account the fall in the pound and also the value of property. And the size of these discounts are, are massive by historical standard and easy to overlook given, given everything else that's going on. There appears to be a consensus building, I, I say hesitantly, but there appears to be a consensus building and certainly the, it's the base case for most economic forecasters out there at the moment, uh, including some of the larger banks, that a no deal cliff edge Brexit uh, will be avoided. Uh, a recent poll of economists by Bloomberg found that some sort of deal, even if it's a skeleton trading arrangement, was still the base case uh, for the majority. Now, the economic stakes for concern, I think, have been heightened by COVID-19. If you believe a pragmatic solution will be found, even after uh, a rerun of the 11th hour negotiations and the rhetoric that we had last year, and it all feels a little bit deja vu at the moment, if there is this pr pragmatic outcome, there is the potential, of course, for the the, the sterling discount uh, to get uh, or to narrow. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is just my last slide before I wrap up. It's just to really, I think, just to underline uh, the um, appeal of property for, for anyone looking at it from uh, an investment angle. And what you can see here is the relative performance of resi property, residential property versus other investments. 
uh, given what we've seen in recent months with the oil price and on stock markets, I think it's uh, of particular interest. It shows the quarterly price change and I think just underlines how property is inherently less volatile than other asset classes. And that's precisely why it's held in the uh, institutional investors as they head portfolios uh, of stocks and bonds. Uh, and the last slide, please, to pull all of that together and make some conclusions. I think the first thing to say really is that the market has rebounded much more strongly than most people anticipate. What happens in the longer term, I think, is less clear. Science is ultimately going to dictate the timetable to some extent, and there isn't really a precedent for that in modern times. However, we can be we can reasonably anticipate that this won't be the same roller coaster ride of 2008, 2009. Unemployment is not forecast to be uh, as prolonged. The interest rate environment is completely different, which is one of the reasons that supply and demand dynamics are also unique. Uh, and furthermore, we've gone into this downturn after many years of repricing. So overall, things are very strong in the short term. In the long term, the exit from the property market from this pandemic should be smoother than last time round. In other words, what this doesn't uh, herald, I think, is the global financial crisis market. Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, that's it from me. Uh, and I'll now hand over to Rachel. Thank you. And thank you everyone for your time today. I want to take this moment really just to introduce ourselves as Mortgage Advice Bureau and what we're seeing from lenders today and what's been going on. So quickly to give you a quick summary of who we are. Mortgage Advice Bureau, we have access to over UK, uh, 90 UK lenders. I think it's really important to look at what's happened over the last few months of the pandemic with this. Back in April, we saw this drop down to pretty much about 50 UK lenders were operating at full capacity regarding their lending opportunities, where we've seen that increase back up to the 90 UK lenders. With the products as well, it's always on average 11,000 products we had access to, where in the previous months, we've seen that drop down as low as 6,500 on some occasions, where lenders have been increasing dramatically over the last few weeks. And what's really been interesting is that these have been increasing more in the buy to let arena than on the residential side of things, which gives great confidence in where lenders see the lending happening over the coming months. Um, we have access to our specialist broker desk as well. So for our high net worth, also our foreign nationals, but indeed our commercial aspect of investors from your first time investor to your SPVs. So it's really, really good to be doing your homework up front at the moment. Lenders are asking for certain requirements. Um, so being in the best position to proceed forward is so, so key. Um, we also think it's so important to carry on this new mode of living where face-to-face -face is no longer what we're used to anymore and offering online appointments and telephone to enable all clients to be able to proceed at the most speediest opportunity. If you could move to the next slide, please, Ed. So current mortgage offerings across uh, the UK at the moment, obviously you've got your residential and government back schemes as well as your investor schemes. What we have seen as previously mentioned is how many more lends have come back to the arena but offering more buy to let and investment backed offerings than on the residential side of things, which is something that we've not seen for about the last 18 months. So when lenders have had to come back to the market, they've had to relook at their credit risk profile where they want to be um, promoting themselves, where they want to be offering the most competitive pricing. And what we have seen is the buy to let market has moved forward a lot quicker and faster than that of the residential. Um, which is on both sides for UK and foreign nationals. Um, lenders are, have a need and a want to lend and they're looking at what the best ways to do this is. Next slide please Ed. Stamp duty obviously is having a fantastic impact on the market at the moment and will continue to do so as Tom very kindly touched on. Uh, we can see this now as being more looking at economical rather than political. And it's really important just to make sure that you are getting the right guidelines and advice whether the second property stamp duty will be applicable to yourselves and how you're setting up your investment portfolio. Next slide please. So market today, obviously like every industry, the pandemic's had quite a big impact on it. But what lenders have done is really looked at where is the best places for them to be lending. What we've seen is when they've lend a return to the market, they've done so with rates at 1.19 for buy to let. 
which is lower than most typical residential rates at the moment and is also lower than buy to let rates were prior to the pandemic. So when they are looking at where their client base is going to be and where they want to increase volume, then buy to let is definitely the way forward for them where they're comfortable and also confident. Obviously, high volume of inquiries since the property market reopened. We've seen existing landlords are expanding their portfolios, both UK based and overseas. And re um, renters are at an all time high. And we're going to continue to see this. When looking in the media and seeing all the analysts, over 30% of applications have been declined over the last um, three months. When you break that down, majority of that of over 85% were residential. That's because when they're evaluating residential applications, unfortunately, they are scrutinizing them a lot more stricter than they have done previously. But when it comes to the buy to let arena, they've already had these um, new ways of reviewing applications for so much, such a long period of time now. It's norm, so no change has really been made to take place in that part. With the Bank of England being so low at 0.1%, Lenders obviously want to take the opportunity to be lending against this. And from a buyer's point of view, the rates are indicative of that. With all industries, they have got their quarters to hit. They need to hit lending targets. And that's what we are seeing with more of their um, fellow staff coming back into branches, into offices. Um, we are seeing things turn around a lot quicker. But more importantly, we are seeing more of the lenders coming back with more LTV options as well as branch offerings. So when we're looking at the property market today, um, Tom showed all the stats regarding the supporting of where the property market is, how it's going to be looking over the coming months, and really showing that the confidence is there. And it's really important to kind of look at everything we've been through over the last few years, from recovering from elections, Brexits, um, and coming into 2020 on such a high to then have a pandemic hit. With the stamp duty relief in place, the low mortgage rates, and the benefit of both capital growth and income return, the investment market is returning so much quicker than everything else. And lenders are showing this in what they're doing when we look at what products are available and also what lenders have returned to. Some lenders have returned just to offer buy to let options, not residential, which is unheard of before. We see more and more lenders changing their direction on where they are usually looking for their clientele increased dramatically, which they are intending to do for the foreseeable future. It's not just a short win, which shows that they can really see that this is where their comfort is and that they can see it being a lower risk for them than actually taking maybe your higher loan to values on a residential basis. With this in mind, um, it's so, so key for anybody who's looking to invest to really do their research on what's possible, what the best strategy is to invest in property, whether it is doing individual name or corporate name. We've seen a huge increase on limited companies being set up to buy portfolios through and the reliefs that are given in that. This is something that lenders are backing. Prior to pro about 18 months ago, it was mainly just your specialist lenders who looked at this, where we see more and more of your mainstream lenders really take this into their own and offer more competitive offerings, not just products, fees, but criteria to assist all investors. And this is going to continue to grow for them. And I think even once the stamp duty uh, relief that we have today has um, come and gone next April, this is going to be an area that we're going to see continue to be growing quarter on quarter because there's more stability from a lender's perspective. Really, it is all just about though what the lenders are doing and where they are confident and really keeping into touch with what's going on. Criteria is being changing on such a regular basis. We're used to having rates pulled maybe on a monthly basis where it can be daily at the moment, criteria is changing. So working with somebody closely, um, who's arranging your finance to ensure that you are always in control of what you're doing is so important and to ensure that you are getting the most out of your investment. Uh, for myself, that's everything I wanted to cover today. So if any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer. And thank you for your time. Perfect. Thank you very much, Rachel. Uh, just a reminder, if you did want to ask a question, then please use the Q&A functionality within Zoom. We've had a couple of questions which we'll uh, address at the end. Uh, firstly, from me, thank you, Tom and Rachel, for your time and, and sharing your, your knowledge and insight. I um, found that really, really useful. For me, I'm just going to kind of cover four things. Firstly, 
Uh, if you are about to start on the uh, investment journey, why you should consider new build rather than the second hand market. And then focusing in on the, the potential capital growth you could um, take advantage of if you uh, invest in re regeneration hotspots. Thirdly, then where Barrett London currently are developing and where you can and what yields that you can currently secure across our portfolio. And then finally, just launching the rental guarantee scheme, which is a, a special offer for all the hundreds of attendees on this particular webinar. So if you're about to commence your journey to become a, a property investor or whether you're a seasoned professional, then you need to, you have much, much choice in terms of when you invest, where you invest and, and what you choose to, to invest in. There are significant advantages in investing in new build over the second hand market and really dependent upon your motivations as to, to kind of why you're investing. Clearly, wherever you invest, there is potential for strong uh, rental yield if you pick the right property. However, there are some unique selling points when uh, buying new build that should make the investment more attractive. And I'm going to kind of cover the top three. Firstly, the potential for capital growth may be higher than um, the average capital growth in the area. And I'll, I'll explain more on, on that point in a second. Secondly, it's highly unlikely that you'll have any uh, void periods if you purchase a new build property. Uh, clearly, any void peri periods will uh, derogate your overall yield. Um, but the feedback from kind of all the letting agents that uh, we work with is that uh, new build has a far higher propensity to be let from day one. And after all, if you're a tenant uh, and you can afford the rent uh, in the local area, why would you uh, potentially choose a slightly run down second hand property rather than a kind of a shiny new uh, apartment and therefore uh, you minimise uh, any void periods. And thirdly, with all Barrett London properties, uh, you get a 10 year stru structural warranty, but more importantly, you get a two year fixtures and fitting warranty. So anything that goes wrong in the flat, then uh, effectively we will fix it for you. So giving you absolute peace of mind that you're uh, investing in kind of a no hassle, a hassle free uh, solution. So one of your investment uh, objectives may be uh, that you would like to invest in an area which has uh, high potential for uh, capital growth. And this is where uh, new build can really deliver. Um, there are a significant number of Barrett London developments that are located in regeneration hotspots. So what do I mean by that? Well, regeneration can, can significantly improve an area and the quality of life for its residents. It helps enhance public realm, uh, connectivity potentially, and the provision of local amenities, whether it be parks, schools, nursing homes. Transforming an area into a more desirable place to live and therefore the regeneration ultimately increases the demands for homes in that area. As a result, um, the price growth of potential properties in the area outperform the local market. And what you'll see on the slide there is two, two, a couple of examples. But on the left, you've got Hendon Waterside. So the average price at Hendon Waterside, uh, which is one of our schemes, which we commenced building in 2012, uh, has risen uh, by 128% in capital value in comparison to the, um, the house price inflation that's achieved across the rest of London, that's land registry data. And then on the right, uh, there are a couple more uh, examples in uh, NW9, which is Edgware, and Upton, which is E13, again showing significant um, outperformance against the London norm. So if you are looking to uh, invest in London, where, where can you invest? Well. Um, at the moment, we have 12 live developments currently selling across our portfolio from Ridgeway views in the north of London, Mill Hill, uh, to New Mill Quarter in the south, uh, Hack Bridge. And then we've got developments as far east as uh, Hounslow and Hayes Village in the west and um, Upton and New Marketplace in the east. What you'll notice there is that they are all located uh, adjacent to great connectivity, whether it be the tube or the overground. And that is an absolute requirement for tenants looking to uh, rent a property uh, on a line uh, which they can get to work easily with. Um, the rental yields that uh, we're currently achieving across our portfolio range from between uh, four to, to five percent, uh, with clearly better yields being achieved. That's a blended rate with better yields being achieved uh, on the smaller properties. 
I talked about the regeneration uh, effect uh, a moment ago. That there are four kind of big regeneration sites that Barrett London uh, is delivering. Hayes Village, which is um, in Hayes and Harlington, uh, which is 1,400 units and we'll be building for the next kind of five or six years. We're literally about to complete on the first block there. We've got Eastman Village in Harrow, which is uh, just over 2,000 units. We're going to be building there for, for the circa next uh, decade. Hendon Waterside, which I've already highlighted, which uh, has 2,000 units and we started uh, building 2012. Um, but again, we've got a good five or six years of build uh, left to deliver the uh, 1,200 additional units um, to complete out the scheme. And then in the East Upton Gardens, uh, just under uh, 1,000 units just uh, on the old West Ham ground at Upton Park. So before I start the uh, Q&A, the last thing is to launch our incentive exclusive to attendees of this uh, webinar, uh, which is the rental guarantee. So rental, the rental guarantee is supported by Benham and Reeves. Benham and Reeves have been trading in London for many years and one of the uh, leading uh, London-based letting agents. Effectively, uh, the uh, incentive is available for all reservations up until uh, the end of September. So all you need to do is purchase a Barrett London property. We will include uh, the flooring, the, a washer dryer and a furniture pack, allowing you to rent out the property on day one from completion. Benham and Reeves will guarantee that they will pay you an, an augmented yield of 5% for the first year. They will source the tenant uh, and guaranteed absolutely no void periods for the first 12 months and pay you a gross yield of uh, 5%. So how, how do you take advantage of the offer? All you need to do is go to the Barrett London website. Uh, you find a property that you're interested in. Uh, you make an appointment at the development and then obviously you refer to the investor webinar and the rental guarantee and one of our knowledgeable uh, sales advisors will be able to introduce the scheme to you as in the development, but they'll also talk you through the rental guarantee uh, scheme in more detail. So uh, that's it from me. Thank you very much for attending today. Now what I'm gonna do is uh, just have a look to see what questions we've got. Um, and I will pass them out to the relevant uh, experts. So, um, Rachel, why are lenders so keen on buy to let? What is driving the increase in appetite from the lenders? Yeah, so the main thing is a lot of your mainstream lenders predominantly would have worked in the high loan to value residential whether it be 90 or 85 percent loan to value and when they've reviewed their risk profile coming back after the pandemic they've actually said where do we feel more comfortable from a risk perspective with buy to let it's always a large deposit than 10 or 15 percent and that's been the main driver for them when they've been assessing where they really want to be placing themselves um, it's a key thing for them. So having that higher deposit has given them more confidence. Secondly, um, how lenders assess on affordability side of things um, is different for buy to let. And obviously um, without knowing what security people's jobs have, but also when assessing what happened to income through the pandemic, lenders have been really caught by the regulator about what they can and can't do. So with the buy to let side of things, they're assessing the rental projections, what's possible there. Yes, they will do a minimum check on yourself from an income point of view, but it is actually more of a lower risk for them from the regulatory point of view as well. So it's two points that are doing it, but they're the main reasons. Perfect. Sorry, another one for you, Rachel. Uh, I live in Florida and the income is coming from the US, USA. Can I get a mortgage in the UK? Yes, you can. So uh, it's specialist lenders and we actually have a mortgage desk purely for clients based in the US. Okay, perfect. Um, sorry, another one for you, Rachel. What are the outgoings one would need to consider, e.g. government rates or management fees, etc.? I guess it's about um, assessing affordability. Okay, so pretty much each lender has their own assessments um, when doing their own financial assessment regarding what what they take into account but i'm thinking and uh, correct me if i'm wrong regarding is it if it's what the lender needs to consider they may looking at a uh, service and ground rent solely yeah uh, because the tenants will be paying all the other bills and um, if it's regarding yourself from a tax perspective obviously there's there's different rates from there okay perfect 
A uh, question for me, can uh, I clarify your 5% NHS staff uh, scheme discount and does it apply to buy to let your mortgages and in conjunction with the rental guarantee scheme? No, I'm afraid it doesn't. Uh, the NHS uh, discount is purely if you are going to live uh, in the property, you can't rent it out. It's basically a thank you for obviously all the great work you've done through, through the lockdown period, but it's not there to provide um, investment properties for yourselves. Um, are you seeing, Rachel, sorry, another one. Are you seeing a rise in limited companies buy to let financing? And this has been on the rise for the last two or three years, um, mainly from the tax perspective side of things. So we are seeing this, um, although in some cases the interest rate could be higher than maybe in an individual name, it comes down to the individual's um, full tax profile and whether it's more cost effective but also um, investment beneficial to be in a company name. So we have seen an increase over the last few years um, and over the last few months we've seen more and more investors that are in limited companies buying more properties uh, but it's also down to that they've got the large reserve because we've been doing this for some time. Okay so I think you asked the second part of the question there around interest rates. Uh, the, um, the participant was asking w whether the interest rates would be higher which I think they are, which you're saying they, they potentially are, depending on the individual circumstance. Yes, they can be slightly higher. Okay, perfect. Um, my daughter will be turning 18 in December. Would I be able to buy a property in her name? If right. that's for Rachel, then uh, yes, we can do so. Some lenders are happy with uh, clients at the age of 18, um, and other lenders are happy for it to be entrusted to her as well. So there's definitely ways forward. Okay. Uh, one of the questions were that for the rental yields, sorry, the rental yields that were quoted across all the developments, were they gross or net? Uh, they were gross. Obviously, you would need to take out uh, your costs um, to get it down to net. Um, one for you, Tom. Please confirm what limits describe Prime Central London used in your presentation. Uh, yes, sure. Um, we... Uh, how would I describe it? I suppose you've got it goes from Notting Hill in the uh, in in the northwest down to Chelsea, and then across um, across to the city, including um, the, what's known as the South Bank, uh, and then up to parts of Islington, and then across to St John's Wood again. So it, it, it's sort of it's the market around Hyde Park, uh, plus the city, plus parts of Islington and parts of the South Bank. Okay, perfect. Um, sorry, another one for Rachel. Are there any further requirements due to COVID-19 or otherwise now that would apply for any persons applying for a buy-to-let mortgage who are self-employed? The only thing that we've really seen um, happen with some lenders is that they required a bank statement prior to COVID and then the latest bank statement just to show that funds have been continuously coming in and it's not just been government grants. So that's been the only change of a delayed bank statement. Okay, perfect. Um, one for me, we have noticed that there've been a general delay on release of new properties. Is this related to the delays on the construction side due to the pandemic or is it related to any other particular financial circumstances? Well, I can only really speak for kind of Barrett London, but uh, at the end of March, we effectively, uh, for health and safety reasons, we shut down all of our developments. Uh, and then we had a graduated return um, as the uh, lockdown was lifted. Uh, consequently, that has meant that uh, all of our properties that were due to complete in the summer uh, have been delayed by a number of months as we've kind of ramped up back up to full capacity. Uh, we're still not back up full capacity onto some of our sites purely because, you know, on some of the sites we'll have four or five uh, hundred operatives working and we need to make sure that they're working in a safe and controlled way. So it, it does mean that there has been delayed to completions and potentially does mean that later blocks that were due uh, clearly to be constructed after the blocks that we were, were currently constructing, that they have been delayed as well. But ultimately, you know, we're very clear as a business that we want to get back to 100% kind of capacity as quickly as possible. Uh, and that's what we're aiming to do. Um, there's, there's a number of questions on here uh, in regards to help to buy. Clearly, this is an investor uh, webinar. So what we'll do is we'll go back to those individuals um, directly uh, rather than um, 
take up the time. Another one for you, Rachel. Perhaps we'll just do a couple more and then we'll, we'll close. What criteria the lend, will the lenders follow when lending to a, to a company? Yes, yeah, so what they do is, is they obviously look at how the, uh, the company's been set up and it's got the right SIP code and then they will do a check on all the directors. So anyone who's going to be part of that business will also have a check done on them just to show that they are financially sound. There's no um, adverse in the background, but that's pretty much it. Okay, and the final one for you then, Rachel, uh, before we close is typically yeah. how much uh, deposit do you need to get the best possible rates on a buy to let mortgage? For the best possible rates at the moment, we are seeing 35% deposit um, are definitely the highlight rates, more so than anything else. But lenders are still lending up at 75 and even 80% loan to value. Perfect. Okay. Thank you ever so much again to uh, Rachel and Tom who've supported us with this uh, investor webinar. I hope you found um, it's informative and, and useful. And as I say, what we will do is for the questions that we haven't answered, because some of them weren't 100% specific to this um, webinar, but I appreciate people have got questions so they want answers. We will effectively put, we'll put them onto our, a landing page for you and we will send you an email next week uh, once that's live so you can uh, refer back and, and see if we haven't answered your questions. So thank you very much for your time again uh, and have a good rest of the day. Thank you.